Okay, so hey everyone, um, my name is Daniel Alphonse. Welcome to the this talk, which is called A Year in the React World. So before anything else, who am I? I'm a senior front-end engineer currently working at Seracare. And besides this, I'm also an Outsider Ambassador, a get in structure. And you can find me on Twitter, Medium, and any other social network by the handle at Daniel JC Alphonse. Currently, I've been mostly focused on JavaScript ecosystem, namely React, React testing library, and yeah, pretty much focused on that part. So now you might be wondering, what is this talk about? Well, if for anything else, this is a real life case study. This is something that happened over a year, year and a half of creating a React application, making it grow, and yeah, continuously improving it. So during this talk, I'll present stuff like React hooks versus class components, which was a, a controversial topic a couple of years ago when we started this project. State management, which is usually the hottest topic in the React ecosystem every time, and testing. So a bit more context, once again, we, we had a project uh, started around a year, a year and a half ago. And when we inherited the code, it was pretty much what we had written was using class components. Now, the thing here is hooks had been around for a couple of months and we were starting to see the real value in it, but we still had to justify why would we want to stop using class components? Well, here are a couple of uh, topics why we stopped. The first thing is with class components, we have a bunch of giant components. What I mean by this is with class components, we had to deal with lifecycle functions. Lifecycle functions, uh, in this scenario, you can see component did mount, component did update, component will unmount render. These functions made us write an unrelated code together on unrelated functions. So let's figure the example of this uh, subscription to the store. If I want to subscribe to the store, I would have to do it on the component did mount. If I had to do some, wanted to do some sort of changes, I would have to do it on the component did update. But if I want to do cancel the subscription on this scenario, I would have to do it on the component will unmount. So this would stack up the more stuff you added to your life cycles and it would make the code not as easy to read. Then we had the issue of reusing logic. Um, with class components, there was no way to reuse stateful logic between components. Well, at a certain point we had mixins, but then they were deemed unsafe and we had patterns like render props or uh, I order components, but usually these patterns come at the cost of code readability, um, adding extra layers to your to your code, and that's what we can see on this image here, which is called wrapper hell. And finally, class component class components can be confusing for humans and for machines. So for humans, you have to understand properly how classes work. You have to understand how these work. You have to understand event bindings, just to to get on it while working with React. Um, also, the React team has publicly mentioned a couple of times that even for machines, they had issues with compiling classes and, and on the minific minification process. So as you can see, classes itself had their fair share of issues. So yeah, at that point, hooks had come out and we decided to give them a go. Now you might be wondering, what are the advantages of hooks? Well, most of you should already know this by now, but code readability is the first one. So thanks to the introduction of effects, you no longer need to write unrelated code group together on the same life cycles. You can just create an effect for the stuff that you want to do and um, you're ready to go. The next thing is code reusability. So the introduction of hooks and the ability to create custom hooks. Now you can have a stateful way to, to share uh, state between your components and share values. And finally, the ease of teaching React. Well, at the project that I was working on that moment, we'd be soon hiring some jun junior developers. And we knew that by adopting hooks, it would make it easier for them because they, we wouldn't have to teach them all the background and stuff that they needed to, to work with class components. So yeah, we, we opted in by hooks, we started using them. And there are a couple of lessons that we learned. The first one is probably the most important, but pay attention to the rule of hooks. There's a winter rule for that, and it's really important that you have it configured and pay attention. And with rules of hooks, I mean, I mean stuff like 
not uh, uh, using hooks conditionally and uh, not having all the dependencies on the dependencies array that should be there. It's important that you pay attention to these things because they exist for some reason and it is to save you issues further down the line. Another lesson that I've personally learned is don't pre-optimize everything. It's often said that premature optimization, it's the root of all evil. And what I mean by this is with the introduction of use memo, use callback, it's, well, safe to assume that, okay, we want our code to be as fast as possible. Let's wrap everything with use memo. Let's wrap everything with use callback. And while this might be a good idea, it's often not, not because you might be wrapping stuff with use memo that don't that won't change on every render, that won't need expensive calculations, and sometimes this extra optimization might even cost you performance. And let's not speak about code readability. And finally, stop thinking in life cycles. So, with the change of class components to hooks, we had to change your paradigm. You were th thinking about okay. When the component starts, it will mount. The component will do this, the component will do that. And with the introduction of hooks, now you have to think in effects. And OK, I want this effect to run when this dependency changes. I want this effect to run on this specific scenario. And one thing that I've noticed was that the developers that started learning React after hooks came out, and they had never used class components, got adjusted to this, to this mind process, this mental model of effects very much easier than the people that were already thinking in life cycles. So yeah, this wraps the hooks class components part. Now let's go to the hot topic, which is state. So when we start a project, it's safe to assume that the first question that we ask each other is how we will manage state. Well, when we started and inherited this project, we were using pretty much the most common one, which is Redux. And don't get me wrong, Redux is great, but in my opinion, at the early stages, it might be like using a bazooka to kill a mosquito. It's an unnecessary pre-optimization in certain levels. Let's not speak about the amount of boilerplate that it brings you and the learning curve that you need to do and need to have to, to use Redux. Finally, you often see yourself having the need for middlewares like Tank or Sagas just to do other stuff um, that Redux doesn't support out of the box. So, yeah, you might be wondering, okay, so you have this opinion about Redux, what would you suggest? Well, with the introduction of hooks also came the, the more easy way to use context with the introduction of use context. So, we migrated our code from Redux to Context. Now, Context is great, <laughs> once again, and it's an, you can picture it as an out-of-the-box uh, state management tool that comes with React. The thing is, if you don't um, be, are careful when using Context, you can have a couple of issues, being the first one, the unnecessary renders issue, which I'll talk a bit more on the next slide. Um, you can also see related logic get easily grouped on the same context that makes your context grow and grow and grow and once again will lead to unnecessary renders unexpectedly. And finally, it's also an extra set of boilerplate, the more amount of context that you have to your application. So, yeah, you might be wondering once again, how do I deal with these unnecessary renders? Well, this is probably the million dollar question that one person ha has and listens to when start working with context. So I'll give you an example. So we have this code here where we have a custom hook to subscribe to our context. Uh, we create the context in here and we have our random store, which has a couple of things. This store has a state variable for something that's called something in this scenario. And it has another state variable for something that it's called other thing. Beside that, it has an effect that will run when our something variable changes and will trigger a state update for the other thing uh, state variable. Then it, it's returned from the context and we create a random provider so it can so people can wrap their components with this provider and therefore consume the context. So now looking at the use of this context. We have this example in here. Here we have our component that is being wrapped by our render provider here. 
And in this component, we have a couple of things. We subscribe to our random context and we destructure the something and set something variable out of it. Besides that, we have a console log that will let us know when the component re-renders. And finally, we have a button that when we click it, it will trigger a, a state update of the something variable. So what we would expect is, okay, the component mounts and it will render, I just, it will print to the console, I just rendered. And if you click on that button, how many other console logs should appear? Well, it would be safe to assume that it would appear only one, right? Because we only updated the something variable. No, what will happen is we'll have two console logs extra to the first mount one saying, I just rendered on a console. And why does this happen? You might wonder, I'm only using the something and set something variable. Well, this is because every time React detects a change to something inside of its context, it will trigger a render on all context subscribers so that they can receive the new change. And what does this mean in a, in a shorter way is whenever we update the something variable that we have here, we'll also trigger this effect that will update the set other thing. And even though here we are just destructuring the something, the other thing variable will also be updated. Therefore, when it's updated, React will let to let the component know, hey, look, your context changed. You need to re-render to receive the new changes. Now, you might be wondering once again, so how do I fix this? I only want this to render when something or set something changes. Well, according to Dan Abramov, there are three solutions. The first one, it's to split your context. If you don't need your other thing on the, um, on the context, on the first context, then you can split it into another context and on your component, only subscribe to the stuff that you need. Other thing you can also do is put the component into and use Mimo. So by using the Mimo function on the button, you can let the component know that it only needs to do render whenever something and set something changes. So if you look to this process and we are still using the first version of the context where we have the other thing in it, whenever we click on a button and update the something, it will re-render for the something. It will also re-render for the other thing. But since this button is wrapped with Nemo and only this and this and this didn't change, then it won't re-render. And finally, a very similar approach, it's to wrap your return of the component with use Nemo. So instead of creating another component, you just wrap the render part of your component with the use Mimo. And on the dependencies array, let the Mimo know that it only needs to recalculate stuff whenever something or set something changes. So you might be wondering, um, okay, so you fixed context, you know how to deal with these issues, but did you continue using context? Well. We didn't, and this is, and why you might ask. Well, it's because our state was comprised only of server state. What I mean by this is usually when you're dealing with your application, you have global state. And once again, to this to this type of word, you might ask, but what's global state? Well, it's very simple. Global state is actually the joint force the joint forces on this scenario of the client state and the server state the client state it's the state that it's owned by your application this state is temporary it's local and it's generally non-persistent between se se sessions and you can access it by using uh, synchronous apis and then you have the server state a server state is state that is persisted remotely uh, usually on a database or something like that this is a state that it's a synchronous, which means that you have to access it with synchronous APIs, and there is no guarantees that it's up to date. With server state, it also comes a bunch of other challenges like caching, background updates, deduping requests, identifying and dealing with outdated requests, other performance optimizations or stuff like optimistic updates. Well, as our state was pretty much comprised by server state at that point, we decided that we needed a new tool to deal with it. And what we started using was React Query. React Query is actually a protocol agnostic collection of hooks for fetching, 
cat caching and updating server state in React. And it's super, super great. It made our lives much, much easier. And it, by changing our perspective of state, instead of just having global and having this server and UI state, and this in our scenario at the beginning was only server state, it made us easier to organize our code and understand what we were working on. But at a certain time, there also comes an issue. OK, now we are going to need UI state. What are we going to do? Are we going to continue to, to use Redux or context? What's, what are we going to choose to use on this specific scenario? Well, we started using Zustand. Zustand is pretty great because it, it's pretty much a hooks-based API. And being it all React hooks, it has an amazing learning curve. And it has a, a thing which I really, really like, which, which is called transient component informs. This means that your component um, won't re-render unless it absolutely needs, or you make it explicit that you want it to re-render. Finally, uh, Zustand is pretty great because it doesn't have context providers. It's just hooks. You use the hook, and you're set to go. So this wraps the state part of our talk. Now. Let's go to the final point, but in my opinion, a super, super important point when dealing with React applications, which is testing. So when we started um, a project and when we decided to migrate from class components to hooks, the migration itself went successfully. Everything was great, 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 like our components and after lines of code, everything was working as it did previously, and in some scenarios, even more quickly. But then someone remembered, hey, have you run our tests? And so we did. And this was actually what happened. So almost half of our tests were failing. And you can probably imagine that this was our reaction. We were left to wonder. So everything is working as it did previously. The implementation is the implementation changed, OK, but the user behavior is exactly the same. What's happening here? Well, we did some research, and we found out that the guilty party in here was testing implementation details. Now you might be wondering, once again, what are implementation details? Well, according to Ken Dodds, implementation details are the things which the users of your code will not typically use, see, or even know about. So putting this in perspective, Implementation details can be things like, well, the component props, the component state. The user doesn't care and see these things. And when we looked at our tests, we found out that our tests were deeply, deeply, deeply tied into implementation details. Well, the library that we were using at the time was something called Enzyme. And don't get me wrong, Enzyme is great. But there are a couple of things which don't go um, in par with the same philosophy that we had so far um, and can actually be, be something of testing implementation details at, uh, itself. The first issue or stuff that I, I think that I don't really like about Enzyme is shallow rendering. Shallow rendering, it's pretty much the way that on your component, you only render the shallow part of it. So you won't actually render the entire component itself. You imagine if your component has some children, it won't render the children. It will ignore them. It only renders the shallow part of it. Well, once again, this is not the way that the user interacts with your components. When the user interacts with the component, it's interacting with the shallow part and with the children of it. So shallow rendering, it's not actually a good pattern in my opinion. And we have stuff like querying. Um, Enzyme exposes a way to query for stuff on the DOM by using the find API. The thing with the find API is that, well, first things first, it allows you to query for class names, for component class names. It allows you to query for class of the HTML um, attributes. It allows you to query for IDs. And once again, this is not the way that the user works for stuff on the, on the DOM. And finally, one of the biggest issues that I had and that our tests were full of was using the state function. The state function was the way that Enzyme allowed us to pretty much interact with our component state. And once again, the user doesn't care about the state. The user only cares that 
well, if I click this button, a model will pop up or a request will be triggered and I will have my data. That's what the user cares. The user doesn't care about the state. And because of that, we stopped using Enzyme and migrated to something which is pretty much standard nowadays, but it's React Testing Library. And with React Testing Library comes its main guideline, which is the more your tests resemble the way your software is used, the more confidence they can give you. This is a tweet by Kent Um And Kent is actually the creator of the Testing Library and the React Testing Library. So what are the great things about the Testing Library, in my opinion? Well, the first things first is it promotes accessibility. So by giving you queries and way of querying the DOM that reflect the experience of visual mouse or assistive technology users, it's super, super amazing because when you're testing your components and when you're querying for stuff, you can even find some accessibility issues on your, on your components that you didn't figure out when implementing them. Then it also gives you the possibility to create your own queries by using the build queries helper. This is super, super great, but you have to be careful because if you decide to do so, you have to do it in a way that you don't expose implementation details and further developers. It allows you to have user-focused events by using its companion library, which is called the user event library. By using this lib, you can pretty much interact with your uh, DOM elements the exact same way that the user interacts. So for instance, as for a button click, it will simulate all the events that trigger um, typically happen when you click on your button. And then it gives you a bunch of asynchronous utils that you can use for, well, for waiting for something to appear on the DOM, uh, for waiting for something to have been called, uh, for instances, for waiting for something to be removed so that afterwards you can do your assertions in the better way. Well, while React Testing Library is amazing, I often see a couple of mistakes being done by, well, some younger developers using that, the technology and that don't have a bit of experience with it. And here are a couple of common mistakes that I see usually. Let's start with the first one, which is called, which is using hacked. So usually when um, interacting with the UI, there are things which are called units of interaction. And these can be things like uh, data fetching, um, user events, rendering, and act is actually an, an utility that React exposes on your tests that pretty much what it does is it allows you to be sure that everything that's inside the act has been finished and flushed into the DOM before you can continue your test. So it makes sure that when you're doing your test, everything is done properly. So thinking on this perspective, act, we should probably use act for, well, rendering our component or should use act for, well, firing an event. It makes sense because these are actually units of interaction with the user interface. The thing is, we don't need to because the React testing library already wraps everything that will do some level of interaction with the interface with act inside so that you don't have to. So that's a huge win and it actually affects the readability of your code. Another thing is using get by variants with assertions for expecting something doesn't exist. For those of you who don't know, a get by variant, it's a query that will make sure that the stuff you're searching for actually exists on the DOM. And if it doesn't exist, it will throw an error. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to assert that something doesn't exist on the DOM when we are using a query that will throw an error. This is pretty much asking for your test to fail every time you run it. Instead, we should use the query by variant. A query by variant, it's a variant of query that will pretty much only search for stuff. We will search for stuff that exists on the top, like the get by, but it won't throw an error when it fails. So this is the exact query you should use for this scenario. Using a wait with fire event or non-asynchronous queries. So I've seen this a couple of times. It kind of makes sense for people to think, okay, if I'm doing a, an action like querying or firing event, I need to wait for it to end. The thing is with the React Testing Library, these events are not asynchronous. They are synchronous. So you can remove the await and once again, make your code a bit more readable. Using await wait for with an empty callback. 
So wait for it's um, a function that will allow you to wait for something inside of it to evaluate to true so you can proceed with your test. The thing is often there's a common issue that you will see at the end of this presentation, but people will have an issue on your test that will pretty much let them know, okay, something is going wrong. I'm not waiting for something to finish. So, okay, let's just do an empty callback inside of the wait for and wait for it to happen. The thing is, what this will actually do is it will wait for a tick of your test. And once this tick passes, it will go to the assertion. This means that well, sometimes this test might pass, other times it might not. And this will cause a flaky test. So what you should do instead, it's actually wait for your assertion to evaluate to true. You remove that need for an empty callback in there and you're actually using the function how it should be. Using cleanup. So cleanup is actually a function that the React Testing Library exposes that will allow you to clean up your components after you run a test or uh, whenever you want. Imagine that you want to render the component and clean it up so you can render it again or do something else. Well, it might make sense that after each test, we just call cleanup so it can clean up. The thing is, if we are using a framework that supports the after each global, like Jest or Jasmine, you don't need to because cleanup will actually be called automatically by the React Testing Library. So thank you, React Testing Library, for that. Another issue is using wait for with synchronous queries. Well, what we are doing here actually, we are waiting for a progress bar to appear on the DOM. The thing here is we shouldn't do this. Why? Because React Testing Library actually offers you a synchronous queries. In this scenario, defined by query. So every time you want to wait for something to appear on the DOM, you can use a find by variant query to do that. So. Another mistake is using side effects inside of a wait for loop. So as you are aware by now, wait for will loop the code inside of it until it evaluates to true. The thing here is on this example, we are actually clicking on the button, which has the um, safe text on it. And once you click it, we expect the function to have been called with form data. Now let's think. If it fails the assertion the first time we get here, the code will be looped. So we will trigger the click again. And this might cause some unexpected side effects that we don't want it to happen because we should only click the button once and then wait for the assertion to evaluate to true. So instead, what we should actually do, it's click on the button outside of our wait for and inside of our wait for do the assertion. So. To wrap this presentation, I'm going to talk a bit of probably the most tricky issue that I found while using the testing library and the one that took me a couple of hours of sleep every day for a couple of months, which was the an update to your application inside a test was not wrapped in ACT. So when testing code that causes React state updates, it should be wrapped in ACT. So let's go back a bit, a beginning of this section about um, ACT. So ACT guarantees that every interaction with the DOM needs to be finished before your test continues. Um, so what causes this error pretty much? What I mean for that, I'm going to show you once again code. So let's imagine we have this component, which is called display Pokemon. This is a component that will receive a prop, which is called get Pokemon data. And its prop is responsible for doing an asynchronous request to getting the data. This component also has a state variable, which is initialized to false. That is called is loading, and we have a setter. Then we create a function, which is an asynchronous function that will receive a Pokemon name, and it will set the loading to true. And then it will try to wait for the Pokemon data to be returned. And finally, set the loading as false. On the return phase of this co component, we have a div where we have a button that whenever clicked, it will call the get selected Pokemon function within the scenario to Pokemon Pikachu. And then we have a span when, whenever it's loading, it will display loading to the user. And if it's not, it won't display anything. 
So how would we test this entire scenario? Well, here is a typical test that we would probably do. We would call it should call get Pokemon with Pikachu. In this test, we create a mock function by using the just fn keyword and we pass it to the co component. So when rendering our component, we pass it the get Pokemon data function. Then we want to click on the button that's named Pikachu. So we want to click on this button here. And then we want to assert that our get Pokemon data, which we are passing as props, has been called with Pikachu. Well, well this test might work and um, <clears throat> it might be actually a, a good test at first. When you run it, you're going to run into this. An update to display Pokemon inside of a test was not wrapped in Act. So, <clears throat> another quick recap, just to wrap up. Act will make sure that events have been finished before you can do anything on the UI. So pretty much what's happening here is this warning, it's React way to tell us, hey, look, you're not testing everything in your test. You're missing something. Uh, you're asserting that the function is called. Uh, you're asserting that um, the button is clicked. But you're forgetting something. So what are we forgetting? Well, it's pretty simple. We are forgetting that after the get Pokemon data is called, we will trigger a state update for its loading. So pretty much this warning is there. So that React let us know that, hey, look, you're not testing everything. You forget to test a, a, a simple scenario. So what do we need to do? Now, in this, in this simple example, it's pretty, pretty simple. All you have to do is either wait for the loading text to disappear from the DOM, or once again, wait for the loading test to disappear on the DOM. So you can use either wait for element to be removed or wait for and do an assertion inside of it. And this will pretty much make your test pass and work. So whenever you see the was not wrapped in act, the first thing you need to think is, A, what am I forgetting to, to assert in my component? Is everything okay? And if you look at your test, pretty much often it's not, you're forgetting something. So. Thanks, React, for letting us know. And yeah, with all this experience, I think I wrapped my presentation for now. Um, it was a, a fun, fun ride by growing an application, and it's always is. You have all these issues with state testing. Uh, now with hooks being a standard, you don't have to worry about class components anymore. But if you have to maintain some legacy code, it can happen. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for um, for watching. You can find me once again on any social media by at Daniel GCFons. Hope to see you soon and thank you. Bye.